Nous rejoignons à présent un expert international, vous allez le voir, un optimiste inébranlable qui croit fermement en un avenir prometteur et en notre capacité à le créer et à le construire ensemble. Mieux connu comme étant un des précurseurs de l'industrie 4.0 et le cerveau de la stratégie numérique européenne qui enflamme les thèmes mondiaux d'aujourd'hui. Son nom ne vous est d'ailleurs peut-être pas inconnu, il s'agit d'Eric Von Schell. Good evening and welcome here, Enric. I'm sorry, my French is not that good, but I think most of you will somehow understand me. So um, thank you for having me here. I have the opportunity to talk about the fourth industrial revolution, where it came from, how you can apply it, and what the competencies is. So I call the presentation moving beyond the hype, because there's a lot of hype about the fourth industrial revolution, so you understand what it is. I will also come with an um, a specific example on digitalization for you. So I, it will be a little bit um, forth and back. I will recommend all of you, even though you are executives, take a block and take notes because most of the things that I will come with, you probably won't have heard that way or you haven't seen how it's connected this way and how you want to apply it. So first I want to start off with the good news. I am an eternal optimist about the future. That's the one good news. The second good news is this is my, my, I, this is the last one. And then I have one more public speak this year and I will do no more. So uh, this will be the last time you will hear of me soon. So that's good. Um, so um, just to give you a little bit um, heads up about myself. Um, people uh, know me as the um, mastermind of the digital revolution in Europe and as the originator of the fourth industrial revolution. But my key background is actually, I'm a strategist um, by nature. So I'm supporting the most of the Fortune 500 companies when all the big five consulting companies walk out the door and they don't know how to handle it. That's why I'm actually walking in the door. So far I've been supporting most of the Fortune 500 and I'm currently also doing that but I'm stopping this year. So I'm happy with that very much. So the pictures that you see there, that's my family. I have two boys and two daughters-in-law. They're like daughters to me. And that's my beautiful wife. We've been married for 30 years. So the reasons why I'm actually showing you this picture is that even though all the nice things that people say around me, the honor of all of this actually belongs to my wife. She has been supporting me through my education and raising the kids and much of this. And the reasons why I want to have a personal emphasis on it, and I want to do it from the very, very beginning, before we talk about technology and all of this bits and bytes, right? The centerpiece of the fourth industrial revolution is the human being. Human connects with human. We sell to human. We bond with human. We, and so human is also the centerpiece on how we apply technology, on how we cope with the perspective, set a strategy, and focus on most of these elements. So when that's said, let's go straight forward to it, right? In 2008, when the, when the crisis came, well, in the global crisis, and I was asked by Angelica Merkel to do the strategy for Germany. And um, the strategy for Germany was mostly because the productivity level was low, the growth was low, and Germany is the growth engine in Europe. And in Germany, there's two big kings. That's Henning Kagerman and Professor Scher. Professor Scher is the co-founder of SAP, and Henning Kagerman is the co-founder of, 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 um, of, the, of the process thinking that we have today and some of the software systems that we have today. I was doing strategy with them. And um, what we found out um, is that there were five trends colliding together. That became the digital agenda for Europe. It's called the digital agenda 2020. All European countries in Europe applied them. Everybody wants to adopt it and so on, right? In reality, it's the colliding of internet, mobile phone, social media, big data, and cloud. No big rocket science to it. This is what you see in your phone today when the worlds are colliding together. But after a half year when we announced the strategy and we were sitting together and we realized something quite dramatic. And I will explain that to you and we call that the fourth industrial revolution. So what we discovered is that there are 
six trends colliding together. So you normally, you, you probably know that there's micro trends, um, mega trends, and when mega trends that are 10 to 15 years collide together, when two of them collide together, they create a paradigm shift. A paradigm shift happens when fundamentally everything in all industries are changing. So um, we already thought at a digital agenda when we said that, everybody, it became a global theme. We already thought that was enough, right? But we realized it's even worse. We realized that there are six paradigm shifts colliding all together at once. And they are so dramatic that we called it the fourth industrial revolution. It's fundamentally changing every aspect of human life. How we consume, how we live, how we interact, how our economy works. It will change the borders of industries. It changes the setup of governments, industries. It changes everything in a faster time space than ever before. This is in essence what the fourth industrial revolution what we recognized. Let me explain you a little bit about why it's so radical and what it is. So one of the elements that is so radical because when it, it would be six paradigm shifts and they would collide, it really wouldn't be that bad, right? We, we can cope with it. Every organization can cope with it over a period of time. But the period of time that we experience it in is exponential in nature. So most of you, you have seen COVID and hear about COVID and you think COVID is exponential. Let me tell you very frankly, COVID is not exponential. It's had the attribute in the beginning, but it's not exponential in nature. Exponential is so radical. If I'm standing here and I want to go to the moon, I take my step number one here and my step number 37 would be at the moon and my step 38 would be back here again. So when you think that something that's coming, it's already in your face. So that's something that is, everybody sees exponential as a negative thing. It's actually quite positive when we have the ability to adapt. So that's one of the elements why I'm saying the centerpiece of the fourth industrial revolution is the human being. Because how we build strategy and how companies and governments and countries and families are structured is all around human beings. And human beings, we build skills, we go to school, we go on the internet, we learn project management, we build skills. The more skills we build, it becomes a competence. Between a skill and a competence is always a capability. A capability is our ability to adapt to what is around us. So we can build the skills on something, but we can also adapt to it. So what's happening in the fourth industrial revolution, there's three major areas that are colliding together. It's a digital world, physical world and virtual world. You can see that on your phone, right? It's digital by nature because I can connect with everything around it. It is virtual because I can actually open it up here and actually talk to all of you. I can look at the warehouse, how the performance of the warehouse is, where the order is. And it's physical because I can scan the wall or I can hold it in my hand and I can see where the compass is, where north and south is and so on, right? These worlds are colliding together. From a skills perspective, there are three worlds colliding together as well. There's the engineering world, which is also very much the scientific world. Then there's the IT world, right? And then there's the management world. When I talk about management world, I talk about service management strategies, right? Um, so these three worlds are normally divided up and they're colliding together in one. So the element in terms of the skills we need are quite radically. So what is the fourth industrial revolution? The fourth industrial revolution are six paradigm shifts colliding together. And one of it is exponential innovation. I will go through that. That's the one that you most of you will think, oh, oh that is industry 4.0. No, 
The fourth industrial revolution, most people call it the cyber physical system. That's when you go to manufacturing, but in reality, the effect it has is on people, planet, profit. So we can manage that together. The paradigm shifts consist of the first one is exponential innovation. This is exponential innovation. So it's a set of technology sets that emerges in three distinct ways. And the waves are not waves of maturity. The waves are waves of disruption because one technology sets requires the maturity of one to work together with the other one. So the first one, I think you heard in the first video, digitalization, everybody talks about digitalization. At the World Economic Forum, IBM asked me if we call it IoT, Internet of Things, IoT and digitalization or industrial IoT is the same. It's the connectivity of the devices around you to do smart products around you. Then there's advanced ad ad analytics, um, cloud computing, augmented reality, robotics, and 3D printing. The maturity of this is quite high, right? But the first wave that we have now is very, very disruptive, right? This slide you see here is the same slide that I showed in 2009. But when I showed this slide in 2009, people freaked out, right? The second wave included artificial intelligence. That was seven years ahead. They thought a little bit too futuristic, right? Maybe I'm smoking a little bit. Today, most people are afraid of artificial intelligence because it will take their job away and so on. There's nothing to be afraid of in artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is the automation of intelligence, right? Intelligence is everything that we do around us and we automate that, right? That's in principle, the very simple view of this. So that's the next step of digitalization that comes to that, right? Autonomous blockchain, smart automation, G6 and future of energy. The reasons why I have G6 here and not G5, is because in G5, they have sold us old wine on new bottles. In order for a manufacturer to work, it needs one terabyte upload and one terabyte download. That means that the current, internet, the current telecommunication system we have, if not sufficient enough to help us to cope with how we are expanding on the in, in, internet, right? The technology sets are there, but they are holding back because they want to um, maintain the infrastructure they have as long as they can. It's a, it's a long story. The future of energy is also a quite important one. Um, so when you think about the second wave, the second wave is 100 times more disruptive than the first one. And the third wave is so disruptive, it will change all industry borders, full stop. So quantum technology or quantum science is for most just far out reaching. It will change the fundamental elements on how we view science, how supply chain works, how we view anything in algorithms and all of this. It's fundamentally the biggest change. It's bigger than all of the other paradigm shifts. I will go through that very quickly before, right? Any company, any university that, that is on it and is not jumping on it, they are sleeping in the hour of greatness, right? Then we have cybersecurity, neurotechnology, nanotechnology, bioinformatics, and advanced material, right? They sound quite futuristic. Believe me, they're not. Let me ask you the simple question. Who will be the biggest meat producer by 2020, 2025? Will it still be the Chinese and the Niscos? I really, really doubt so. Will, will meat be artificial produced? I think so, right? Will you need 3D printing for it? Yes. Will you need nanotechnology, neurotechnology, and bioinformatics for this? Yes, you need that very much so. So back at the other ones, I'm going very, very fast through it, right? The other one is the consumer and moral revolution, right? That is very much what we are in right now. We're in a consumer overload. The reasons why we have COVID is because we're in a consumer overload. We have too many people consuming too much in a specific way. That means that by 2030, 
we would need three planets if we continue with the rate that we are now. So we need to change the way we consume, produce, ship, and price. That is a quite radical thing, right? One of the reasons why we have COVID and why COVID is increasing so much is because we have a consumer overload. We are expanding too fast. We are too close connected that it has the ability to spread and our consumption is disconnected in on how we are, right? Then we have climate change. Climate change is a big, big topic, um, but climate change is a difficult one because everybody thinks it's about how we are doing our garbage and electricity and all of this. And in principle, it's not really. The core element of climate change is that we are changing the water cycles. We, we have blockbuster storms, blockbuster floods constantly, right? Why do we have that? We're changing the weather and with the weather, we're changing the life cycles of the water. And by changing the life cycles of, of the water, it will have dramatic effects on how we live and how we consume. Then we have the next one, which is a very interesting one, our economic revolution that we have there. And it has already started very, very radically, right? Our productivity level on how we measure productivity level in companies is broken. How we measure at government level is broken. I've been a, a promoter for this for a very, very long time. Our GDP that we're measuring in, in the governments is shining the pig. It is fake. It is not right. How we measure our productivity today, do you know what this is based on? It's based on Adam Smith. And Adam Smith based the formula of the productivity level on, Ice, on, on Isaac Newton. So I'm telling you, our productivity level on how we measure growth and productivity is based on the falling of an apple. There can be no, nothing that is more wrong that we do in our economic assessment than this, right? So our economic assessment on productivity level, on growth and innovation assessment is fundamentally wrong. So this is changing, changing our foundation on our economy, on asset-based economy and a digital economy that will be driving this. This is quite radically, the revolution is already there. Then we have a rea reality revolution. That's the quantum science to it. I will do that very, very fast and I will jump off these because that's a whole day topic, right? Let me just demonstrate you to give you an aha experience so you realize, holy macaroni, it's coming fast, right? So quantum science is explained in a very simple way. If this is a cable, and there's 1 million fibers in here, and I put 10 megabytes in one fiber. Everything we know today to be true is that the one, the 10 megabyte fibers are coming out on the same fiber because data cannot jump. When I hit on the wave, I can recognize the patterns and I can program it. That's how we have built up any law we, we learn today. Physics, science, chemistry, biochemistry, everything. Here's the problem we have. When we go to micro level, everything is based on quantum laws. When we go to the universe, everything is based on quantum laws. Just we as human beings have designed a, a laws on how we can see things that they react and how we can see it. We know today, over the last 10 years, that the 10 megabyte fibers will appear on any of the 10 million fibers that are here. That changes fundamentally how we program, how the pillars of our economy will be set up, how, we, how energy will be distributed. It changes everything from a principle on that. So that was the shortest view I can give you on the fourth industrial revolution. So this is where I'm saying 
I am literally an optimist. And the reasons why I'm saying this is my last speech, because I'm going on a pension this year. And I promised myself, if I crack the nut, because humanity is on a crossroad, and if I crack the nut on how to manage the triple bottom line, then I'm going on pension. So that I cracked two months ago. And I already made this commitment, so I'll, I will keep it, right? But this is the simple formula. I'm working with um, the World Economic Forum and with many nations to work that out. That's a very simple one, how you do with planet, how you do the productivity level with people and with profits. If anybody has questions, send me a question and I can help you how you, how you can do that easily. It's, it, it's very, very straightforward. It's very easy. Good. Now we'll come to the next section, which is very exciting. How do you actually apply the fourth industrial revolution? You have six paradigm shifts, right? You know it's three colliding worlds together. You know the centerpiece is the human being. And then it's like, oh, Henrik, but this is too much information, right? What do I actually do, right? Very simple, right? I'm giving you the tricks and the secrets what the Fortune 500 companies are doing. When they talk to me and they ask me what to do, I, it's very simple. If you do anything, you need to know what are the drivers and what are the forces, how it's affecting you and how are you are reacting to it? How are you set up to react and how can you do that, right? Most of us has learned that in school, but we don't know how to apply it. We have learned the Porter value chain, but we don't know how to apply it. So I will go through that very simple, right? But the principle is very, very easy, right? When you want to and a value chain, a business model and an operating model is a visual representation on how your organization is and how you want to run your organizations. So normally for any organizations, you do two value chains, two business models and two operating models. Sounds very complex, but it's not very complex, right? Two value chains because one is how you're operating and one is how you want to operate. Two business model, one is how you operate, running the business, and one is developing the business. So one is where you're transforming the business and one is where you are innovating the business, right? And the same goes for the operating model, right? Why is that important? Because everything that goes up to a business model the executives are responsible for and everything that goes down an operating model is how you actually operate. But this is where the chain falls off. Because what the executives talk and what is implemented are two different versions. They don't connect together. So this is an ability. So the most organizations I work with, they have a big four by four where they have the whole value chain their business model operating model, and they have a gardeen over it. So they take it out and they have their systems, their portfolios, their projects, their people distribution, their services, their, their information flow. They can see all of it. So every time there comes a new project, they know exactly where the bottlenecks are and where they need to focus. If they do cost cuttings, they know exactly where's my headcount distribution, where I'm doing duplicated works. So they have a view to take the sign decisions. This is nothing else to take the sign decisions. So the fourth industrial revolution is nothing else than a force and a driver. So an opportunity or a disruption on your current existings, right? Let us just go through an example so this is easier. So if you look on the top, right, you see the red version is everything which is a force, right? So a force pushes on me and puts me out of my current stability. So a force is often what you have to react on to stay in business. And when you see down below, these are the six business models where you take design decisions. And you have an operating model, a performance model, and a cost model. That is the structure of your cost. So this is normally the elements where you say, this is how you operate and how you package your value proposition. Everything where you're getting your cash in on your revenue stream 
It's where you have your value delivered, your service, or or your or your revenue that you are collecting, right? So these are the business models that you're designing. So from the industry 4.0 perspective, the digitalization can help you to automate on everything which is non-core, right? Your operating model, your performance model, and your cost model. But that only supports where you're standing. So the drivers are where you, when I'm standing here and I want something, I need to be proactively moving out to receive something. So the driver version always includes, I need to be innovative. I need to invest and I need to align with what already exists. Whereas the forces mainly drive some transformation. You need to transform your current competences you have to maintain your current status mode of business, right? This is a template. You have a poster after the session, a poster has uploaded this poster. You, it's well described. You can download it and work with your teams on it yourself, right? This is a value chain for manufacturing. This is the same as this one, right? So normally the industry for order series always purpose-driven applied. What is this? It's forcing on and what is you want to achieve? Then you normally look on, now we take the example of digitalization. The first step you have to do on digitalization, and here's the secret, you can do digitalization for 15K. The first step is this in manufacturing, right? You need to digital connectivity and censoring. Once you have done this, then you focus on your um, digital engineering, right? And when you have done this, you focus on your digital operations. So you have to learn to crawl, walk, and then run. This is the basic principles. You have these slides anyway. I'm not gonna go through that in details. There's tons of this stuff for you and I share that quite freely. So this is how you use a value chain. You simply need to learn these basic tricks. And this is where I'm coming to the next session. What are the competencies that you need for the future? If the centerpiece of this is humans, you need the competencies, so your ability to adapt and the skills, how you can cope with exponential disruption. So this is a simple element that I go through most of organizations in the beginning, I talk about which skills they need. Where is it hurting? When they know which gap they have, they also know what they need to focus on. If your growth is transformational improvement, you're down at resource gap. You don't have the resources to meet your performance. If your element is on, if your gap is on performance, then you also need, right? So this is a simple formula where the formula is in the middle and you exchange what you need to in, um, transform or innovate. The centerpiece of any organizational change is always people. So the first element I recommend most of you, if you need to apply the fourth industrial revolution, do a value chain. And with that, you understand where's the gap that you need to meet, both internally and externally. Then the next element, which I highly recommend you, you need to get to know the basic principles on how you take decisions. So value chain, business model, an operating model. Now I can already tell you the secret of where the chain is falling off. The chain is falling off in the business model. This is the business model. Because you see over here, there's certain elements you take decisions on. So you saw in the second wave of the exponential innovation, smart automation. Let me tell you smart automation is the biggest opportunity for, co for competitiveness for higher performance and better service delivery. So this is quite simple. So the process is what you do. The service is what you deliver and the service most people are not responsible for. Let me give you an example. If this is an activity and this is an input and this is the output, where do you think that 99.9% .9 of organization measure. They measure on the output. 
That means the activity has already happened. So anything we need to do today to be competitive and be more reactive, right? That means you need to set up your digitalization, not based on your processes, but based on your service. And if you don't have a service, you do it on your workflow. Because here you have your information flow. Here you have your data flow. Very, very two different things. If you ask a normal traditional consultant, they will do it on a process. If they mention process to you, all alarm clocks should be clinging for you on your digitalization. Why? Because you do output driven measurements, right? You can do output driven measurements on everything which is non core. That's around 70 to 80% of your organizations, right? So then you have your operating model down there. So these are the skills that you need to learn. Here's an example. Anything what you want to get out in the industry for the zero, you want to have an impact driven outcome. And for doing this, you need to develop a strategy that is competitive in essence, right? Either competitive advantage, comparative dynamics, comparative advantage, competitive, parative, hyper competition or competitive rivalry, right? I hope you know these terminologies. If not, you can probably learn that at, at, your, at your business schools. But you can see there's a certain sequence here on what you need to do in order to achieve it, right? This is nothing else than your business models down here, right? That means you need to learn your business model skills so you can design your business as well. So this is a simple view that I, I want to give you here, right? 80% of your organization, depending on how you feel in your revenue, if you are in hyper competitive area, your revenue is below 5%, right? That means you're competing head on head and you are competing on price and product and delivery, right? This is the element where you need to focus on non-core, right? You need to automate everything which is non-core. So the level of integration, the level of optimization needs to be high. You focus on cost level, operational level, and performance model. Everything where you're competing head on head in your organization, which is the 15%, which where you are industry specific, right? The 80%, you mature the hell out of your digitalization. If you don't have digitalization there, you have a problem. Everything in your comparative advantage, industry specific, right? You're trying to be minimum as good as your competition. This is the level where you need to be service level driven because you need to be minimum as good as your competitor. And the 5% is where you're differentiating. Let me give you an example here with Apple. I did the strategy for Apple and with Steve Jobs, right? The 15% is where they are as good as the competition on marketing, on the product development and so on. Everybody believes Apple is better in product development and innovation, but they're not. Everything where they're non-core, they deliver a high operational, high performance, low cost. So a high level of integration where they differentiate and they have done for many, many years is in their supply chain. It took us eight months to design, design their supply chain. How come when, when they can deliver a demand on the product and they can deliver it at the same time, you can cash in when you have something. Samsung has been trying that for many, many years, right? So this is some sort of, I'm just telling you the tricks and the trade of the, of the elements which you need to learn somehow today. This is one element that has changed quite radically the element on how you manage your operational excellence, all right? Remember I showed you value chain, business model and operating model, right? This designs how you do your pumping heart and nervous system. So everything which is simple by nature, like financial processes, do cost cuttings, right? You ask the financial guy, they will say it's very complex. No, right? You can actually put a monkey to it quite easily. So you can automate the hell out of this everything which is complex in nature, right? So you have a nature to this, right? When it's performance driven, like a warehouse, like supply chain management, this is the element where you need to align. You need to focus on, on workflows, efficiency, right? 
everything which is tactical by nature. Do you see what I'm, what you're doing? So you're designing what is delivering which by which nature, and thereby you are changing the key element of this, right? And by this, I'm actually closing off. When you have these four level of skills, you should be good enough to do simple things like this. When you do cost cuttings, and I took this slide up because I know cost cuttings is a very, very hot topic for all of you, and you need to do cost cuttings. Either you do cost reduction, cost improvements, or cost advantages, right? But do you see the difference? When you do cost improvements and cost advantages, the first element you do, you invest money and you will lose money before you get a bigger cost out of it. If you only do cost cuttings blindly, right? You cut to the bone. So you see down here, the numbers are nothing else than the decision cycle in which sequence you use the business model. There's no rocket science to it, but there's rocket science when you don't know it. I'm telling you how to cook a spaghetti. When you don't know the ingredients of a spaghetti, it just tastes good but you don't know how to cook if you cook the spaghetti first or you cook the spaghetti with the sauce or whatever you want to do, right? So in closing, before we open with the questions, I am very, very passionate about this time we live in. I believe this is the greatest time that we are in. We are at the crossroad for human mankind. Everybody of you that is listening to my voice, we will be judged by our kids and our grandkids on the decisions that we're making now. There's no reversal that they can do. We are laying the foundation and because it's such a fast moving target, if we don't take the right decisions, our children and our grandchildren cannot reverse it. I do believe that we have the ability to do so. The technologies will be the enabler, but the hardcore decisions on climate on the sixth extinction rate that we are in and many other elements are very, very tough moral decisions. And one thing we learned with the COVID, governments cannot take decisions. This is like giving a child a loaded gun and you let it play with it, right? So what I'm telling you, the elements that we're focusing on, how the economy can grow, how you can reach your consumers, what are the business opportunities? How you can focus on climate, right? They are residing within you. You are gifted with innovation, with knowledge, with opportunities to take this. I believe this is the greatest time that we have to do with difference and to move forward. I also believe that we as a human being can do everything if we have an ability to work together. Now, what I didn't tell you at the very beginning, I'm highly dyslexic and I was stuttering when I was a very young child, right? Somebody took the time and effort to believe in me when I was, I was in a school that was a special school for children with special needs, right? I had a teacher that gave me skills, but he gave me soft skills to realize I see something that somebody else doesn't see. And the reasons why I'm telling you this story, if we wanna cope with the problems that are around us, when you are using teachers around you, when you see people struggling and you help them, realize that they probably have skills that you don't have, but they are not aware of the skills that we have. If I would know that I can see patterns that nobody else can see, Right? I've always shared what I have for free for everybody freely and I constantly do it, right? Why? Because I know it's a gift I have. And most of you that listen to my voice, you will realize you have a gift and you see a connection of something and then you gift it to somebody else. Thank you very much for the time. I think we have some time for questions still. Yes, sure. Thank you, Enrique, for uh, your uh, speech. It's uh, so good to hear the, that kind of, of speech. You're such an optimistic person. Thank you very much.